come on, don't be. I'm, uh, there we go. As you can tell, things are doing what they want to do, not what I want them to do. <laughs> there we go. Oh, Richie. <laughs> just, just checking before, uh, before Dan gets started. Everyone see his uh, U.S. Navy interwar aircraft camouflage presentation? We were all on mute. Yes. Just affirmative. Yes, we you can see him. That's a big tin for <laughs> Yes. There you go. All righty. Oh, okay. Thanks, Dana. <laughs> Not a problem. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep, you sound good. All right. Um, I'm going to give a, an intro because normally the folks in the chapter know how I, I like to do these talks. But uh, I understand that there are folks from different parts of the country that haven't heard me yammer before. Uh, boy, are you in for something. Um, there are a lot of books out on Navy camouflage. Uh, very few of them deal very much with the interwar camouflage development. Um, the book I'm working on right now is supposed to cover World War II. And there's going to be a lot of new stuff in there. Uh, this is not to say that any of the other researchers that have written such great books uh, have missed the point. Uh, what has happened is that the National Archive has gotten really good about uh, declassifying and processing and describing large numbers of files that were not available years ago. And um, I just happened to be lucky enough to be one of the first to get into those files. Now, they include a lot of the reports that have been seen before, but the, the juicy stuff for me is all the background correspondence and the handwritten notes even, uh, because that's really what puts it into perspective. It's what were they really thinking at the time and why did this happen? And quite often, it, a lot of things are gonna have happened because people weren't thinking, they weren't communicating. All right, so let's see if, there we go. Now, most modelers are going to be happy enough to know what colors you apply to your build. Um, you look at the picture, you've got your decals, you know what you want to apply. Uh, what you will see, though, is that the proper colors aren't always going to be coming out of a bottle of hobby paint. Um, I prefer that what we're going to talk about right now is going to give you more options, not, not make you feel like you've got a wrong idea or or you're doing something incorrect, or, oh, don't buy that company's paint because they screwed it up, but uh, give you the opportunity to look at paint and say, you know, that is screwed up, but I add a little gray to it or a little blue to it or whatever it is, and I'll feel happier with it. Um, and personally, of course, I'm more interested in what they did and why, because they never seem to find much time to actually build a model anymore. And of course, as always, <clears throat> the big rule, don't go telling somebody they screwed up their model and put the wrong colors on it. And by the way, Dana Bell said they screwed it up. Uh, it's the last thing I like to hear. I, I love to share, but uh, you'll notice I rarely come in and, and will share uh, that you screwed up a model. If you ask me what should I do or what should I have done, I'm happy to talk with you. But uh, please, after somebody's put a lot of work into a kit, uh, let's keep it all friendly. All right, here's pretty much where our story is going to begin. Now, uh, it's actually beginning in 1934. This is a Martin PM2 uh, with BP-2F flying out of Coco Solo at the Canal Zone. Um, and it all starts with this man, uh, Rico Bota, who's uh, born and raised in Australia, joined the Navy in 1917, became a naval aviator in 1919, and took command of VP-2F in 1932. <clears throat> 19 January 1934, he writes to the Bureau of Aeronautics, Bu Air, and he asks for all available information on naval aircraft camouflage. Uh, while he doesn't say why he wants that information, it, it appears that he was preparing a, a surprise attack on the so-called enemy fleet for Fleet Problem 15, which was going to happen in three months uh, in waters near the canal. Now, the Fleet Problem was a big war game that the Navy ran <coughs> every year. And um, you always wanted to be on the winning side. It helped with promotions and things like that. 
The interesting thing is that the Bureau of Aeronautics didn't have a thing. They, they found some magazine articles, they found some army reports, but nothing they had had anything to do with naval aircraft camouflage. That despite the fact that during World War I, the Navy had done a lot of experimenting with their own camouflage schemes. Um, there are a lot of things on ship camouflage, but nothing on aviation camouflage. It just so happened that Charles Bittinger was working with uh, the Naval Research Lab on ship camouflage in 1934. So when Buer went to the um, went to National or Naval Re Research Lab and asked if they had anything, they said, "No, we don't. But we happen to have a camouflage expert here." Uh, Bittinger was one of those Renaissance kind of guys in 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 my line. He he uh, trained in science and engineering at MIT, and then went straight to Paris to become a fine artist. Um, during World War I, um, he worked, uh, worked with the Navy on ship camouflage. After World War I, he moved to Wright Field and helped the uh, Army Air Service work on aircraft camouflage. And by 1934, he was doing scientific work on ship camouflage for the Navy. Well, the view air said, uh, we'd love to talk to you about aircraft camouflage and uh, being a Washington, D.C. native. On the 2nd of April, 1934, he drove across town, uh, sat down with the Bureau of Aeronautics for the rest of the day, and, and they talked about everything that was going to happen and had happened and could happen in camouflage. And he just pretty much convinced the Bureau of Aeronautics that uh, he knew enough that they wanted to hire him. Um, unfortunately, they, they set everything up for him to meet with Bota down at uh, Fleet Problem 15. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, Bittinger was so busy that he was unable to get off the ship he was on and go ashore and, and talk to everybody about aircraft camouflage. But even without special camouflage, Bota did manage to sneak two of his aircraft under the top cover defensive airplanes and bomb and strafe uh, his, the enemy ships and uh, carriers and everything. So uh, his suggestion was if we can only get the camouflage worked out, we can be even more effective. Now, what Boda did get from Buer was a bunch of army reports, some of which had actually been written by Bittinger and a few commercial articles. And uh, Boda did not worry too much about uh, undersea or underside camouflage. Um, he accepted that the army, which was claiming a pale blue with purple patches along the leading and trailing edges, would be the perfect camouflage for all airplanes. Uh, this didn't matter too much to Boda because he had flying boats and they were all using water-based paints at the time and there was no way to get underneath one of those things and, and paint it up with a, a water-based paint. So we just accepted that the, um, the Army had the right colors down, and he, he decided that's what they would use if they ever got around to camouflaging something. But he did begin a series of measurements of the water around the canal zone. He got one of the earliest photo exposure meters and started taking uh, readings of all the different uh, reflections of the sea. Uh, they noticed that the colors that uh, seemed to work best, they took color charts up with them and they also took watercolors and they mixed their own colors in flight to what they saw below. And they saw that a, a, a dark blackish brown, uh, a dark green, or a dark blue would probably be the best colors. Now these are the original color chips and as you can see there's very little difference between them as, as I scanned them. Uh, this is what he sent in for his recommendations. Uh, he was really interested in protecting his aircraft when they were low over the water or when they were parked or, or uh, berthed uh, in the water. And he wanted to have um, a test that ran a, a series of dark multicolor patterns on at least one airplane. Compare that with another airplane in a single dark color. <clears throat> he also wanted to do some tests of flat black. And I proposed that after he ran these tests, uh, he'd send the uh, reports to the Bureau of Aeronautics for their evaluation. 
And uh, he also asked that Mr. Bittinger be involved. Uh, Boda was not the kind of ego that wanted to shut somebody else out. He really wanted Bittinger down there because he valued the expertise. Well, by September of 34, uh, Bittinger had been hired by the Naval Research Lab Embuware to do some studies and a practical test. They were going to give him a thousand bucks, that's $250 a month for four months' work. They were also going to give him $200 to buy supplies. Uh, he immediately got on the train and uh, traveled out to see Kodak in, in Rochester to talk about optics. Uh, he traveled on to Wright Field to spend two days talking to the uh, uh, Materiel Division about what they were learning about um, uh, camouflage. Then he went to Pittsburgh. I can only guess he was going there to talk to paint manufacturers, but we really don't have any record of, of why he was going there. In the meantime, he had a test being run by Naval Research Lab where they painted a 30-inch dark blue-gray fuselage band on a single uh, O3U2. Uh, they wanted to do two things. They wanted to find out if the paint would simply slip off the airplane because it was water-based, and they wanted to know if, if putting a band on the side of an airplane like that could even be seen. They found when the airplane was a mile away, you couldn't see the band with the naked eye. They also found when it was four miles away, you couldn't see it with six power binos. So they decided that patterns really were not going to be of any use to them. The one big thing that, that Bittinger brought with him that nobody had thought about was actually a color standard. And he used Munsell and convinced the um, folks at Wright Field that Munsell was a good deal for them too. And basically what Munsell was doing was creating a series of colors. You had, can everybody see the, um, my cursor on their screen? Anybody see my cursor? No. No, I'm sorry. Well, um, normally when I do this, my cursor shows up, but it's not working for me today. I, 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 I see it. I got it. You got it? Okay. At the top of the screen, you see yellow. Uh, over exactly. here, you see, um, uh, where'd it go? There's blue. Blue. Blue, yes. And over there somewhere is red. Uh, give me a break. There it is. There's red. There it is. Then between the two, you have yellow, red. And between yellow, red and red, you've got red, yellow, red. And all they were doing was basically breaking things down. Uh, they just gave you a basic idea. Oop, let's go back one. Oop. There we go. Back one more. There we go. Uh, it was basically giving you a, a series of colors. The farther you got away from the um, from the center, the richer the chroma would become. And then again, you'd have a value as for the amount of uh, of darkness that you were dealing with. Here, you've got the six values. So. Uh, this color right here, for instance, would be uh, yellow, red. Oh, where'd it go? Let's go out here. Let's pick this one. I uh, can't even read it on my own screen, wouldn't you know? Here we go. Uh, here we would have red six slash four. And anyone with the uh, with the Munsell chart would know that this color was red six four. They also ran the uh, individual colors this way. You could see the purple, blue, red section from blue, green, all the way over to red. And you would have, uh, for instance, here you would have five or eight slash five for this purple, blue right here. Um, it was simply something that the military hadn't, hadn't been accustomed to. They had not been using uh, a range of colors that you could refer to across the board. Bittinger submitted his first report in November 1934, and he set a, a number of rules. Now, the important thing about his report is the title. Preliminary report on, oops, let's back up again. Preliminary report on sky camouflage of naval airplanes. Sky camouflage. He was only interested in making airplanes less visible from below. If you're on a ship and you're anti-aircraft, you want to have that airplane less visible. So, rule one, the upper surfaces were to be a dark gray blue as Munsell purple blue 5-2. Now, let's go back one. Purple blue 5-2 is actually this color here. It's not really, uh, wait a minute, where is it? 
So he's this color, not that dark. He was choosing a color that would blend with the blue sky. Undersides, he wanted to paint a light gray or a light blue or even a light gray blue. And he mentioned a couple of months cells. Then vertical surfaces would be the same light color, the lightest color that you chose for what he called rule two. Um, again, I'm hitting the wrong buttons, please pardon that. Miscellaneous surfaces um, would be the light color of rule one. And again, he meant rule two. And that everything should be matte, not glossy. And this was news to the Navy also. He didn't want any sort of specular reflectance to show the airplane up. He produced uh, uh, three color paintings. This is one of them. He only did one of them or one set of these paintings in color. And all the other reports had uh, black and white photos of those uh, uh, drawings that he did. And he only did the drawings to show you what he didn't like. What he was basically saying, and you can see it over here, if the reader is somewhat disappointed with the effectiveness of the camouflage, he'll have received the impression we wish to, wish to, re, uh, wish to convey. And again, these are the two paintings he did to show you that using a pattern, even a disruptive pattern, did not make your airplane less visible, it made it more visible. So he did not want any sort of patterns for his sky camouflage. In December 1934 to January 1935, Bittinger and Boda finally meet up and have to hash out how they're going to do their camouflage. Uh, there are reports in the National Archives. I found out where they are about three weeks ago, but I can't go in and copy them. This is the only known photo that I've been able to get my hands on from their tests. Um, and what they decided on was a combination of what Bittinger wanted for sky camouflage and what Boda wanted to hide his airplanes against the sea. They chose uh, a, a deep blue green with yellow, uh, a dark yellow green for the upper surface colors. Uh, the sky camouflage would uh, combine with that as lighter tones underneath. And um, best of all, there are supposed to be 24 other photos from this report. I hope when the archives reopen to be able to find and share those. Now, You'll remember that uh, Bittinger had been talking with the folks out at Wright Field. Uh, Wright Field decided the Navy had probably figured everything out and in their own uh, catalog of color paints, because the Army was responsible for coastal defense, uh, they decided that they would add the Navy's sea green color and the Navy's dark blue color, uh, which is actually supposed to be dark blue green, to their own catalog of colors when they had to camouflage for overwater work. All right, so February 1935, everybody gets together, Buair, National Research Labs, or Naval Research Labs, and Bittinger as a representative of the NRL, and decide on three things. NRL produce an instruction booklet on how to camouflage your airplanes. Uh, Buair would stock the materials and pay for the uh, presentation of the uh, final report. And the assignment to the report would be very similar to what had happened in the Coco Solo tests. The NRL would manage the tests, Buair would fund and support them, and the operating forces, meaning the fleet in San Diego, would execute the tests. Handbook of Instructions comes out in March 1935. Now you realize they've only done one test, and this is how you're your camouflage is all supposed to be done. They codified everything they learned from the Coco Solo test, and they standardized a pale purple blue for lower surfaces. And again, if you had a, water, uh, a flying boat, and your flying boat was naval gray, or, or what we would call aircraft gray, um, that would be good enough. They would have a, a pale purple blue on the vertical surfaces, and on upper surfaces, they'd have a dark blue-green for sea camouflage. Now, if you only were worried about avoiding being seen from below, you could omit the blue-green. And if you had a really large airplane and you wanted a pattern, a third of your upper surfaces could be painted this uh, dark yellow-green. They also found that uh, in their night tests, 
that a very dark blue black was actually harder to see through searchlights than um, simple black paint. And they provided a series of color chips for everybody to mix things in the field. Now that in itself would prove to be a big problem for everybody. Um, we all are modelers, we've mixed our own colors, but um, mixing your own colors to match a standard is not as easy as everybody believed. Um, they would also, oh, by the way, the color drawings are in the archives, and again, I cannot get to them right now. But here's what matters, this is what's worth repeating. The standard colors are blue-green and yellow-green on your upper surface camouflage. All right, now we get to those field tests that everybody wanted to run through the operating forces. The tests were delayed until November of 1935. Um, didn't have the personnel to do the work. They didn't have the supplies to paint the aircraft. They painted one three-plane section from each of 11 tactical squadrons, all of them per what they read in the handbook. That's 33 aircraft minimum. And yet we don't have a single photo of one of those airplanes yet. Each unit had to mix their own paints. Generally, the results were very poor. They were given a, a three inch by three inch color chip. They were given a bunch of dry water or dry paint to mix together and water to throw in there to apply it. They were also given um, LePage glue to add to help the paint stick to the airplanes even better. Now they found the sea camouflage was fairly effective, even though the colors didn't match very well. But they found the sea and, and lateral, or the sky and lateral camouflages were too dark. This was the first phase of the tests. This was supposed to be the end of all the testing, but they decided to go to a second phase. They decided that they didn't need to paint 33 airplanes in order to test it. They decided to go with six BFC-2s from VB-2B. They decided to lighten all of the underside and lateral colors for the second test. They decided that the first aircraft would use dark green and gray sides. The gray would be broken with white stripes on the undersides, but that airplane crashed before the test began. It was not replaced, and they did not test that scheme. So let's see what they did. Here are the drawings they did, and again, one report says enclosed are the 15 photographs of the aircraft, but no photos were attached to my copy of the report. This is similar to what Airplane One was going to be. It was going to be the dark green, it was going to be um, a blue green, and then a pale, uh, or the pale yellow green uh, disrupting the upper surface colors. The undersides were going to be the pale purple blue, the sides were going to be the gray with no tone at at all. Um, the diagonal stripes that were supposed to go on the fuselage were not uh, not actually applied to this airplane. Airplane two, just overall pale neutral gray. And again, you'll see between these airplanes that they're concentrating on, on um, hiding the aircraft and seen from below. Airplane three, uh, they're trying to hide it from below. They're, they're dappling it with uh, blue. Mm. Airplane uh, five, <laughs> light blue overall. Mm. And airplane six, uh, light blue overall with a disruptive pattern of, of uh, uh, dark uh, blue-green uh, stripes running up and down the sides. All right, they found that those undersurface colors were too light. So they decided to uh, run a second or a third uh, test, lightening up the underside or darkening up the underside colors a little bit, completely repainting all the airplanes uh, from phase B and uh, testing a, a lighter yellow green on leading and trailing edges of the stand, what they actually called standard blue-green on plane three. And uh, they wanted to also attempt to camouflage one airplane to um, limit the amount of paint they had to apply to a standard airplane to, to camouflage without having to repaint the whole thing. 
They also flew the, uh, the camouflaged airplanes in formation with two aluminum painted BFC-2s and two gray painted F4B4s. And here's their number one airplane. Again, standard blue-green. They've accepted this is the color. Uh, gray on the sides and dapples of uh, purple blue uh, across the lateral surfaces. Uh, again, as I say here, you think the Luftwaffe invented this stuff? No, we beat them to it. Um, <laughs> nice job of mottling, Art. <laughs> Pardon me. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, plane number two. Here they're going with the blue again, but they thought using a, a, a neutral gray, and of course it doesn't look neutral here because they were using water paints, but using a neutral gray sawtooth pattern, they hoped would disrupt the shadows uh, on the sides of the airplane. Here's the airplane where again, they're concentrating on, on lighter undersides, but they're using a, a lighter uh, uh, yellow green or um yeah yellow yellow green uh to disrupt the uh leading and trailing edges and they found this to be superior to any of the other things they were testing somehow they never used this again but they did find it worked better than anything else they had they also had one airplane but they hoped by simply throwing um, a disruptive color across the aft fuselage that might prove to be more effective for a variety of camouflage uh, situations. And then there was this standard airplane uh, where they put the disruptive pattern of gray, simply trying to cut down on the uh, aluminum varnish and the uh, yellow upper surfaces and the red tails. Um, they found this was okay, but not great. Uh, the lighter gray, was probably the best, a slightly lighter, well, basically a gray that went somewhere between the gray they used in phase B and the gray they used in phase C was probably best, but they never tested it. Um, the current camouflage were just as good as, uh, uh, or non-camouflage colors were just as good as camouflage, except the aluminum airplanes should be dulled. And one of the proposals they had was to simply take steel wool and polish the aluminum with steel wool to dull it. Um, another proposal was something that some of some of the modelers from my generation may remember, where we were told to add um, cornstarch to our glossy paints before we applied them to our Airfix kits. Well, they actually did that uh, back in the 1930s. They also said the the very light and very dark tail colors, black, white, uh, things like that, should be eliminated. And if C camouflage is necessary, dark blue green is what should be used. And again, the big important thing they say here is if more experiments are desired, they should be performed by an experimental unit, not by a, uh, a field unit, not by an operational squadron. That if is important because by August 1936, Buer says that ah, we're done, we got enough. And all for, uh, further camouflage testing in the U.S. Navy is either for a ship or for artificial illumination, what would become Project Yehudi uh, during World War II. And of course, we're not going to get too deep into the artificial illumination. 1939, all right, here we are. 1936, they say we're done. 1939 is the first that we start talking about camouflage again. It's almost like something happened to get their interest uh, peaked. <laughs> So June, September 1939, they start talking about not a way to camouflage the airplane, but a way to easily cover the, the brighter parts of the airplane. And one thing they thought they could test was adhesive tape, scotch tape, actually uh, tape in different colors applied to the aircraft to see if they could cover over the uh, the. Uh, squadron colors or the ship colors on the airplane. Excuse me. Uh, it worked as you might expect if you ever wanted to put uh, tape on a model airplane and leave it there. Uh, simply the tape came off as the adhesives dried or in their cases as the uh, as the uh, slipstream wore them away. 
Okay, so seaplanes had all been assigned. I'm jumping back here just a notch. Patrol planes had all been part of the base force until mid 1938. And all those tests that were run by Boda and uh, Bittinger all were results for base force. In mid 1938, base force pretty much got out of the patrol plane business and all of the squadrons were assigned to a uh, scouting force. And just about a year later, in August 1939, Scouting Force says, uh, uh, we sure could use some instructions on how to camouflage our seaplanes. The information they were sent back was that dark green and dull aluminum would be the standard, um, standard colors to camouflage your seaplanes. It isn't until October 1939 that the Navy even begins to consider permanent camouflage. Everything they've tested, everything they've advised as standard is water-based camouflage, usually mixed with LePage glue to help it stick, but nothing about enamel, nothing about dope, nothing about lacquer. But then of course, just like the Army, they learned that Lockheed is delivering Hudson's does appear, watch this, I wonder if I can, no, I can't do it. <laughs> I was hoping I could fix that. Yeah, like I said, I finished this 15 minutes before we got together. I never got the time to run in and, uh, and do a spell check. But those Lockheed Huddens were really great airplanes. And uh, as I recall, Galland actually said, give me a squadron of Huddens and I can beat the British. But um, <laughs> <laughs> For foreign export, they were using permanent camouflage paint. And Buer wanted more information. And that didn't mean they wanted to do it, but they wanted to know more about it. So um, in late December 1939, the Navy publishes tentative requirements for application of camouflage to fleet aircraft. They want to reduce specular reflection. In other words, they don't want the airplane to shine. They want to finish the undersides and vertical surfaces with non-specular aluminum. And in this case, they are talking about aluminum mixed with LePage glue and water and white paint uh, as a temporary camouflage scheme for underneath. And of course, the standard dark chrome green on top. Now, they also mentioned that you could use dark blue or dark gray or black up on top if green wasn't immediately available. So they are definitely still hooked on the idea that green is the paint to be used. And they also want to retain the national insignia, uh, kind of required by uh, the conventions that we had signed in peacetime. And again, those paints are to be non-permanent. You want a paint that you can put on, and after we win the war next week, we can simply wash the paint off again. <laughs> I mean, who would dare raise a fist against us? All right. Uh, in December 39, they also uh, decide that they do need to run a new test. And they give it project number 3606. Then they ask the Naval Aircraft Factory to test day sea camouflage along the New Jersey uh, coast. They were going to use a sky blue that was mixed from ultramarine a monostral blue that I actually had to look up. It's an artist pigment, uh, an organic copper based blue. Um, they also wanted to try a, uh, a lighter sea gray. They wanted to try a sea gray that was darker than air. Dana, gray. yo, Dana, the camel sour, uh, sky blue, um, ultramarine is a dark blue. Yes, and what, what color is that monostral blue? It is, um, it is a medium blue. It is a blue that is, uh, Lord, what could, I, what could I describe it to? And the problem is it's a mix. So they're not actually saying, but they are talking about a dark blue here. Oh, okay. So, so the sky blue is actually a dark blue. Yes. Okay. Uh, very, well, when you say dark blue, if you think back to what Bittinger was talking about in a dark blue, you know, um, you'll know just how not dark that is. We're not talking insignia blue or anything that dark. We're certainly not talking the sea blues that, that came in the 19, late 1940s or mid 1940s. 
Um, but they are talking about a, a, a deep, rich blue. Okay. Uh, they're also talking about steel blade, uh, steel grays mixed from aluminum and lamp black and a medium blue. And in this case, they're actually talking about a dull version of true blue. Uh, so they run their tests and they decide by February 1940 that dark green is better than dark gray or dark blue. So we're still... In February of 1940, talking about dark green for our, for our airplanes. All right, one of those fleet problems comes up every year, and here we are with fleet problem 21, March through April 1940. And they decide to actually do some operational tests on the camouflages of the time. They were going to do two SOC Seagulls. God, I would love to find a photo of these airplanes. Mm -hmm. um, one to three patrol aircraft from each patrol wing, not just one to three uh, patrol aircraft, but they're talking one to three from every patrol wing, and then three TBDs from VT-5. Now these aircraft were predominantly to have aluminum undersides and vertical surfaces. But the VT-5 airplanes, you can see, uh, here we go, here's, uh, Here's VT or, or 5T13. They're all supposed to have dull aluminum undersides and vertical surfaces. You can see a little bit of the uh, tail color showing through here. And then the tops were to be the standard dark green. Uh, however, VT14, this airplane, was to have the same scheme, but with a very light mottle. You like that word, Mar uh, Art? Ooh. Yeah, go for the <laughs> mottle. Good for me. Uh, light mottle. Of, um, of dull aluminum on the top. And of course, over here, you have um, 5T15, which has the same basic scheme with a heavy model of um, uh, aluminum. By the way, the joke about modeling and art goes back 50 years. Uh, <laughs> Easily. <laughs> Easily. Uh, but anyway, um, they were evaluating not only the uh, the capability of the airplanes to remain invisible when seen from below, but would uh, breaking up the dark green make them less visible when seen from above? Now, once they got to La ha uh, blah, 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 blah. they got to Hawaii. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they repainted the upper surfaces completely. They they took off the uh, dark green and they repainted everything a dark gray, and then again. Uh, put varying degrees of uh, uh, aluminum mottling on top of each of the aircraft. And then they moved into insignia. Pearl Harbor and they repainted the upper surfaces again, now using black with varying degrees of um, uh, aluminum mottling on upper surfaces. Here's 5T-15, the aircraft that had the heaviest mottling. Obviously, uh, it has been wet. It's being pulled aboard after a, uh, a quick dip yes. in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And yet, most of the camouflage paint is still there. Mm -hmm. um, not all of it, but most of it is still there. Dana, I noticed there were no under wing markings either on the carrier. No, this is back when camouflage was you hide your airplane completely. And they had not uh, not gotten their their gear together and figured out that they still had to mark the airplanes. Okay, we're going to, there we go, jump to McClelland Barkley, another artist involved in, in the whole idea. He had tested a disruptive optical illusion camouflage scheme with the Army in 1938. Uh, he painted up uh, B-18. Failed miserably. But in 1940, he approached the Army or the Navy saying that uh, he would like to test the famous Barclay camouflages on Navy airplanes. And they ran those tests in September and October. And as you can see, mm. the, the basic uh, schemes were laid out uh, we for optical illusions. They had two Buffaloes, two Vindicators, two uh, TBDs, and two BTs. Now the colors are, we now know what the colors were. He had a special ultramarine blue. He had a darkened version of that. He had the same neutral gray that the Air Corps was using for their temporary camouflage. He actually wrote to them to get permission to use it in the Navy test. 
and he had white as his basic undersurface color. The one exception to all of that was a single vindicator. Oh, whoa. Yeah. There's a model. <laughs> yeah, I know. Isn't it going to be fun? Um, <laughs> single vindicator. But this particular airplane, the entire left wing was painted in standard dark green. Just a comparison uh, between what uh, Barclay thought would work and what the Navy already knew would work. Now, we've never found pattern drawings for these airplanes. And the reason for that is they never made pattern drawings. They sent Barclay large scale models, um, probably 24th scale from what I'm gathering in, in the writing about the models. Um, and he painted up these models and brought them with him so that they could paint up the aircraft. Um, the models have since disappeared. Uh, there were a number of requests from different admirals to have the models sent to them for <clears throat> evaluation and uh, basically something looking good on your desk when they have your, your picture taken, I guess. Uh, these disruptive optical illusions were considered a total failure. They're not, even, uh, they're not even good dis uh, disruptive patterns in the sense that if you look at, you know, at ships, when they, when they, when they uh, camouflage ships, you did get some deception of motion and, and, and shape and stuff like that. This is nothing. This is, this is almost like an advertisement rather than a uh, <laughs> camouflage. Indeed. And, indeed. What, yeah, Dana, what, what, I, also, I, I was going to say, I also noticed that the entire wheel and tire are painted so that you don't see the tire on the underside of the wing. That's right. Exactly right. And as a matter of fact, that is one practice that would be carried forward into World War II, so it would be later abandoned. But that'll be another chapter in the book when I finally get it. <laughs> you know, the, the maximum advantage of these camouflage schemes was to fake Moss out of his shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and there's another story that goes way back. Keep them in the National Archives permanently. Uh, the story of D. Moore McMillan. We'll have to tell right. that story someday. <laughs> if we have time at the end, I'll fill you in on that one. Um, what Barkley was hoping was that it was from a distance, as you approach the airplane, all of these disruptive uh, optical illusion camouflages would confuse you enough that you would uh, have the wrong pursuit curve. You would not attack the airplane properly. Um, However, unlike ship camouflage, you'll notice that when ship camouflage is all that dazzle stuff, the greatest threat is from submarines or other ships firing from a distance. And the advantage was that you were always dealing with a, uh, uh, a two-dimensional target. Essentially, the two-dimensional pattern that you put on your ship made it very hard for you to tell exactly what you're looking at. Was it coming towards you? Was it sailing away from you? Was it even sailing in the other direction? Or was it sitting still in the water with a false bow wave? Yeah. Uh, airplanes, you don't see them that way. You basically see a three-dimensional object with a bunch of paint on it. And every time anybody has tried to do it, the scheme has failed in nearly every, uh, every test. That includes the Ferris camouflage. Um, yeah. Dana? Yo. What was the intention with this? Was it that an aircraft observing this machine in flight from above it would, would be confused or not, or miss see it or what? Um, essentially what, he, what Barclay was hoping was above and behind and off to a side, you would look at it and get the same uh, confusion that you would see the airplane passing to the left when it's actually passing to the right. You'll see that the lines that you would see that would help you understand exactly what you were looking at uh, would all converge at different points. Let's go back to the buffalo. Nope, oh, let's go this way, there we go. You can see that the lines and the circles were designed to give you a concept of where the airplane was heading and Barclay had hoped that, that concept would confuse you as to where it actually was heading. It did not do that. And again, in, in the Navy on ships, when the danger was from aircraft, you were no longer a two-dimensional target sitting in the water. You were a three-dimensional target with a whole bunch of really pretty paint on you and you became mm. far more visible. 
which is why the, uh, the navy would go to overall blue or overall gray when the kamikazes were the threat. It, it mattered who you were worried about. Um, if you're a two-dimensional target to submarines, you want that pattern to confuse what's being seen through a periscope. If you're a three-dimensional target to a kamikaze or a, a Luftwaffe bomber that's sitting out over the Bay of Biscay, you want to make sure that you're invisible, not, not highly visible with a bunch of confusing paint. Then, then from a distance, these camouflages from the air were of no value. No value whatsoever. They made you more visible. And uh, once you were more visible, it was very easy to figure out which way you were going. Thank you. Not a worry. Now, we've all heard about the, the green SPDs. And what I can tell you is I don't know if they were green. I believe that some of them were green. But uh, I can't prove that. I know that uh, Pete Bowers and a number of, of other folks had a picture of an SPD2 um, that was supposed to be uh, dark green. Now for most of the period we're talking about, dark green was the standard upper surface color. Now here's, here's what I have got. November 1940, uh, Commander Aircraft Battle Force to uh, sink us, uh, recommends that all SBD-2s be delivered in non-specular aluminum to avoid any sort of delay. However, the Bureau of Aeronautics proposed changing those instructions to dark green over a non-specular gray instead of uh, aluminum, aluminum paint. You notice at this point, we are finally talking about permanent camouflage. We're arguing about what that permanent camouflage should be, but at least we're talking about it. Um, so Buair has this one idea. Uh, Comair Bat Force has a different uh, idea, but it's the first indication that we're getting that dull aluminum is not a good idea. This is the first time that we're actually talking permanent paint and we're talking not using dull aluminum. No matter what you do to aluminum, no matter how much um, uh, you buff it with, with steel wool or no matter how much, um, uh, what was the powder? Um, no matter how much powder you add to the mix, you're not going to eliminate the glint entirely. And they wanted to get a color that eliminated that, uh, that glint. So it doesn't prove that they were uh, green. However, the very next day, Buair and the Naval Aircraft Factory begin research on permanent camouflage paints. Because even though they're saying we want you to paint them in a permanent finish, they hadn't identified any permanent paints. And that same day, the Commander for Aircraft Battle Force recommends the use of a blue-gray instead of dark green. Now there's no reason under the sun for him to say blue-gray, other than he thought blue was prettier than dark green. Nobody <laughs> has run a test that said blue-gray was more effective. As a matter of fact, if you remember back to the earlier tests, every time they ran a blue, they said that it's pretty good, but dark green is better. So. CNO says we're going to issue a new camouflage instruction for permanent camouflage, and it will be no later than March 1941. But 5 December, the Naval Research Lab is developing new color standards, and they're still including dark green as the new color standard and not blue-gray. So people are starting to get into a rush about developing new camouflages for their, their aircraft, but they're not able to communicate. And I believe that was because the internet was not working for some of these units <laughs> and their email was not getting through as quickly as required. Atmospherics again. Yeah, it had to be that. All right, here's December 1940. This is uh, uh, the Fleet Air Tactical Unit out at San Diego. And they are in December 1940 actually testing their latest dull aluminum mix on an SB2U. They found it worked very well. Um, this is a, a March 1941 photo, and it's very, it's not a very good photo is what it boils down to. And also, it's backlit, uh, backlit. So it's quite possible that this airplane has been repainted 
in light gray by the time this photo is taken. But I believe they did not repaint it. I believe we're still looking at uh, overall dull aluminum, uh, just backlit. And I know it's this airplane because the tactical unit or fleet air tactical unit only had one SB2U. So it had to be this airplane. I just don't know if it's it's still wearing the, the dull aluminum scheme. Dana, it looks like there are two different colors on it. From the pilot's shoulder back to the observer, there's a, there's a lighter whatever it is. Indeed, indeed. Um, now, if the Navy had switched over as they would eventually to using lacquer and dope, I would expect that the lacquer would not match the... Um, the dope, no matter what you do, it's nearly impossible to get two different paints to match. The problem with that is that if they had switched to aluminum lacquer forward and aluminum dope aft, that demarcation should be occurring right here, not right here. I don't know why you're getting a shadow there or a, or a different shade. I, I've seen what you're talking about and I cannot explain it. Good question. It also looks like the paint's been rubbed off by the observer where he steps. That would not be unusual, <laughs> especially on a test. That yeah. are, well, never mind. We're not going to do that. Uh, all right. Dana, Yo. Before you finish, and I don't want to push it in now, but before, before you finish, will you, would you comment on the paint of the aircraft on a film? I guarantee 100% of, of us have seen which is the Technicolor production of Dive Bomber. I was watching that just for this whole project. I should have my notes out about the time checks and, and where certain things happen. Um, yeah, I will talk about Dive Bomber in, in a wee bit. Um, okay, you've seen these photos. Uh, they're uh, life photos. Uh, you've seen the, this is the, without a doubt, this F4, F3 is dull aluminum overall, except for the tail. And as some of you have probably heard from some of my earlier talks, um, getting ahead of themselves, uh, Grumman had actually painted the tails for the Navy. They painted green tails and, and black tails for the next two squadron worth of aircraft that they were going to deliver. Cool. And uh, they said to the Navy, well, now you've just changed the contract on us. We've already painted the tails. Would you like to paint a, or pay us to repaint the tails in dull aluminum in the Navy? Of course, said, oh, no, 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 hey, just deliver them, not a worry. Um, <laughs> is, that the, uh, is that the dark green? That's the willow green identifying willow. ranger. Okay. Yep. So the dark the, uh, green is actually yeah. darker. It's ranger and wasp, right? Nope. Oh, yeah, the black for wasp, the green for ranger, yes. Yep. Go ahead and paint one of these up for a model meeting. I love any scheme that you can do, that you can put it on the table and someone will come over and tell you, you forgot to put the chrome yellow on the wing. <laughs> you know, I just love coming up with things like this and giving them to somebody else to build, because as I've mentioned, I don't build much anymore. Um, just to get it out on the model table so that somebody will jump in and say, hey, you know, fella, you really ought to get your your act together and study those colors a little better, mm. uh, which is why I ask you not to do that. But anyway, <laughs> all right. <laughs> December 1940, Commander Patrol Wings, which is part of uh, the U.S. fleet, directs the Bureau of Aeronautics to paint one PBY, blue-gray over light gray. After all, we've already decided that's the scheme we want to use. This airplane, this PBY-4, Bureau number 1241, part of VJ-1 at San Diego, photographed on 10 January 1941. As you're reading faster than I'm talking, it is the <laughs> first ever Navy airplane to be painted blue-gray over light gray. Now, not only is the scheme not standardized, but they have not yet put out color chips telling you what the blue-gray is supposed to look like nor have they put out color chips telling you what the light gray is supposed to look like. But needless to say, since um, uh, Patrol Wings Commander had decided to paint them this way, this was the perfect color scheme. All right, so, uh, what, what's my date here? Uh, back and back and back. Uh, 10 January 41, we're backing up to December. 
All right. Now here's Buer authorizing Douglas to paint and changing the uh, contract to paint all their SBD2s light gray. All right, the very first light gray color cards aren't even issued until three days later, and there aren't many of them being circulated. Buer begins changing the contracts, saying uh, all of your carrier-based airplanes and battleship and cruiser-based airplanes should be painted light gray overall. Patrol airplanes will be an exception. Okay, we get four days later. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Commander Pat Wings decides blue-gray will be approved as the standard for all of his airplanes. Now you have to realize we have got somewhere near 40 to 45 airplanes, PBYs, that have already been painted in dark green over light gray or dark green over dull aluminum. And yet, we cannot find a single photo of one of those airplanes. There are reports as each unit painted the airplanes giving you the hull number, like 12P7 or whatever, giving you the bureau number off the tail of the airplane they painted. And yet we cannot find photos of these aircraft. Driving me nuts! <laughs> and, um, and as you look at this aircraft, this uh, SBD, it's pretty clear to me that the airplane originally had been painted uh, dull aluminum in permanent paint, then overpainted with um, uh, light gray. But because you're painting one color over another, that paint is not sticking very well. It's coming off in flight. It's coming off from people standing on the airplane to maintain them. But nobody's standing back here. That's just rubbing off as the airplane squeezes through the air. Um, Dana? And, yo. Is this, the, is this light gray the color, which is, in my, my experience, usually referred to as neutrality gray? It is referred to as neutrality gray that is entirely invented by modelers. There, ah. is, no, there is no color called neutrality gray. Okay? Thank but you. if you're talking about neutrality gray, this is what you're talking about. Thank you. Gotcha. Not a worry. Um, what has happened is you have neutrality patrols setting in around the same time the light gray is turning up. You have neutral gray in the Army. And a number of modelers back in the 1960s started putting it all together and invented the term neutrality gray. This is not that. Um, or it doesn't exist, but this is that. How's that? If it were, this would have been it. There we go. All right. So, uh, 30 December, Buer starts issuing orders and changing contracts um, to paint uh, blue-gray on patrol planes. They, again, have not issued the color card for blue-gray. All right, things start happening fairly quick. Yeah, notice fairly quick in the Navy means uh, nearly five months later. Um, Commander Battle Force announces that all 93 cruiser and battleship airplanes have been painted in light gray camouflage. So we know if you find an airplane that's sitting on the tail end of a cruiser or a battleship, an SOC, a, a, an OS2U, or even a, a leftover O3U, if such a thing still existed in May 41, <laughs> um, and it's light gray, uh, it has to be from uh, the start date, I believe, was 23 April. So between 23 April and 21 May, the entire fleet of 93 aircraft is repainted. Wow. Um, the carrier aircraft are slowly being repainted. Now we jump ahead to August, and Commander Aircraft Battle Force directs that all aircraft uh, on carriers or on battleships or on cruisers should now be painted blue-gray on upper surfaces and sides. They do have one thing they neglect. Um, they neglect to let uh, Buair know that they've made this change. So Buair is bus busy having um, manufacturers crank out airplanes in light gray. The aircraft start arriving in uh, San Diego and um, they have to be repainted immediately because uh, Commander Aircraft Battle Force wants blue-gray on the upper surfaces. By September and October, nearly every unit in um, Battle Force 
and scouting force has reported that they have completed painting their aircraft blue gray over light gray. That's all the carriers, all the battleships, and all of the um, uh, cruisers. So it isn't until September 41 that Beware learns that this change has occurred. And of course, by 13 October, once they've cleared up that that's really what battle, what uh, the fleet wants, um, they start changing the contracts again, telling people to start applying uh, blue gray. Now you realize there is no blue gray to apply to your aircraft. What they've done is they've sent out a chip telling you what the color should look like and a rough approximation of taking so much uh, light gray, so much insignia blue, so much insignia red, and so much white, mixing them together and applying that to your aircraft. So most of the airplanes that we have going to war in, in 1941 in blue gray over light gray are some ridiculous version of what blue gray was supposed to look like. This is uh, 6 September 1941, a uh, picture you've all seen before of, uh, 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 geez, I wrote a book on the airplane, I can't think of the name, Kingfisher, uh, being hauled aboard Arizona. Okay, and this is what the scheme looks like. You'll notice that by this point, they have come up with how they're going to apply their national insignia. One above the left wing, just like the Army, one below the right wing, just like the Army, and one on either side of the fuselage, just like the Army. And of course, if you're part of a neutrality patrol in the Atlantic, you have a, a national insignia on the nose also. You can see here that they're choosing their colors to make them less visible from a distance. Against the blue-gray, you've got black. Against the light gray, the word Arizona is in white. Here's one for you. Can anybody uh, jump in and tell me what's wrong with this? September 1941, the Atlantic Fleet, uh, BT-5, Vindicators, based at Naval Air Station Norfolk. How's that car going to take off of the aircraft carrier? Oh, yeah. Well, that's the Admiral's car. They're just going to strap uh -huh. it to the bottom, carry it out to the carrier for him. I got you. <laughs> okay. So anybody, anybody look at these Vindicators, tell me what's wrong with these Vindicators, and I'll give you one hint. It's a camouflage issue. Hmm. Hmm. The wings are bent. They are bent. And you they know, should have, they this should is be the pylon gray. racing yeah. version. Yes. Uh, what was the answer? They should be in blue gray. That's right. The orders had come out that air, any airplane that had wings that folded upward like this, meaning uh, uh, SB2Us and, and TBDs, were supposed to apply the, the darker color to the underside of the folding wing. The idea being that on board the ship, you didn't want your aircraft camouflage making your ship more visible. Um, VT-5 had been repainted at Norfolk, but they hadn't noticed that little part of the order. And so this is, go ahead and put that on a model table and see what you hear. You know, I'm telling you. But it's what they did. They got it wrong. They, and there are other pictures, of course, of VT-5 taken uh, about two months later. And they all have had the uh, underside of the uh, outer wing panels repainted. All right, favorites of mine. This is Philippine Islands. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, we keep seeing these photos in the Philippines, and we keep hearing that these were last-minute rush jobs because the Japanese had attacked. Well, this is October 19th. October. It's a little yeah. early for that. Yeah. <laughs> this is in preparation, and you can see that some, one of these airplanes appears to be wearing the blue-gray scheme. It's got the single camouflage star. Most of the airplanes here have got the single camouflage star, but several of the airplanes have got a multi-tone camouflage scheme, including some of the smaller aircraft. This is a much softer image. Uh, I didn't copy it myself. I'm going to go back. I've got the negative number. But this is in August 1941, anticipating the Japanese attack. Still and clear. again, multicolor schemes of some variation. Here we are in May 1941, still in the Philippines. And you can see multi-tone camouflage schemes um, in a 
this early, the stars are on both wings. My belief is that after many years of saying that you're going to camouflage your aircraft dark green, dark blue green, and dark yellow green on top, that when the Philippines began to get ready for what everyone expected was a Japanese attack on the, on the Philippines, that that is what they actually used. Now we've got oral, um, oral records, oral histories from people saying, oh, we use different blue grays, and that's possible. But if you've ever seen the waters around the Philippines, nothing's going to make you stand up more than something that's not green or brown. And um, I don't believe that these airplanes are blue-gray. Do I know what they were? Hell no. But I really believe that all those tests going back to December 1934 and January 1935 resulted in this, uh, these Pat Wing 10 airplanes being variations of the green upper surface camouflages. I'd Dan, love to go through the records and find proof of it. And there's a good possibility that records of the USS Augusta, um, the USS Augusta was flagship for the uh, Pacific fleet at the time. And not many people spend much time looking at the, uh, what, 27 feet of records of the USS Augusta in the National Archives downtown. I believe the reason there's that much paper from Augusta is because Augusta was the flagship and they weren't recording everything about what happened on board the ship. They were recording everything that happened on the Pacific fleet. Yeah. I would love to get my dirty little hands in those files and find proof of what they were painting these airplanes. The Asiatic fleet. What did I call it? Pacific fleet. Yeah, thank you. Asiatic fleet, you are you are right. The important yeah, thing, all those orders we were finding earlier were for uh, the Pacific fleet, and the Asiatic fleet was not bound by those orders. Dana? Yo! You remember Jim Moss when he did the D, the Dutch DO-24 article? Absolutely. Which was in operating in the same area and yep. showed DO-24s in a kind of a mud camouflage over white? Yep. Uh, what do they call it? Milk white and mud color were the two like colors. Yes. Yep. Yeah, I actually found the DuPont uh, color numbers for those uh, those paints in the National Archives many years ago. And cool. uh, But good. I've never been able to get DuPont to spring with color chips to let us know what the actual color was supposed to look like. Dana, do you have any information on that ship? It looks like an old four stacker that lost yeah. two. Yeah, it, it's been... Uh, you can see the crane on it, and I cannot remember which one it is. The lack of a, uh, a hull number means that we're not looking at a, a destroyer any longer. We're looking at one of the um, oh, the auxiliary ships for float planes. Um, they modified a number of flush deck four stackers to to uh, to act as flagships for the uh, uh, patrol aircraft, particularly the smaller ones. There are some diorama possibilities for you. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh. All right, where are we? Okay, now, here we are, two days after Pearl Harbor. I did say I'd get through December 1941. And you see two very different survivors of the uh, latest unpleasantness. One of these airplanes, I could almost guarantee, is blue-gray over light-gray. And you can see the single star on it. However, you're looking at a second airplane, much darker, no national insignia anywhere to be seen. It is the Seagull scheme used by VP-11, devised by Lieutenant Commander Dayton R.E. Brown. Now, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how the man that designed the Brewster Buffalo suddenly found himself a camouflage expert uh, for the U.S. Navy. And Dayton Brown indeed did become the head of the Navy's camouflage section in World War II. Real. However, the man that invented the um, Brewster Buffalo was Dayton T. Brown, and this is a totally different individual, Dayton R. E. Brown. He tested two airplanes. One of them he painted black on top and white on the bottom, and came up with varying degrees of white and or of uh, gray moving down the side uh, to have this graded camouflage scheme on the side of his airplane. 
A second airplane he painted dark blue on top and white on the bottom and did the same thing. He found that the black and the blue were equally effective. Neither one was particularly better than the other. However, he found that all of the blue pigments he had tested faded rather rapidly. So he decided that uh, they'd go with the black, the gray, and the white uh, as the scheme. And every airplane but one was painted in black, gray, and white in what was called the CP Seagull Scheme in VP-11. Um, this became, when Dayton Brown became head of the camouflage section, this became what they called the gray scheme and what eventually was simplified into what we all recognize as the dark blue, the uh, or, or sea blue, uh, intermediate, intermediate blue. blue, and white scheme, the graded camouflage scheme uh, of 1943. This is where it all began. And again, Dayton Brown, being that he's testing camouflage, did not apply national insignia to those airplanes. So, oh, one other thing before we get to the end. Uh, the very first thing that we end 1941 with is objections from the fleet that the blue-gray that they're using on top of their aircraft is far too light, that it is not working. Not only does it fade too rapidly, but even when it's not fading, it is too light. And uh, that is going to lead to the next chapter about the true story about blue gray, dark blue, and light gray and white uh, during 1942 and, and 43. So, again, any questions, my friends? I'll stop the share. Dana. Come back to normal. Dana. Yo. Uh, any comments on the film? I guarantee 100% of, of us have seen which is I'm the sorry. best record of pre-war Navy aircraft in color that I know of, and that is, of course, Dive Bomber, Indeed. which has a lot of weird stuff in it. Well, guess yeah. what? I have not seen it. So, you have not, not seen it. Of us. Uh, uh, do we have a way of banishing people from the Zoom conference? If they have... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Honestly. And, and to be honest with you, I don't. this is the first time I've heard of it. You've never heard of Dive Bomber? Good gosh. My God. I saw it years and years and years ago, but I don't even remember it. Well, I bought it several yeah, years ago. Fred McMurray. It's the guy that sang this. It's the works. Yeah, but the guy that's saying this, Don, is the only guy on the screen that doesn't have gray hair. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I've got them. Even more reason to ban you, Don. <laughs> <laughs> Dana. Well, let me recommend that that everybody get their hands on Dive Bomber or just keep an eye on Turner because they do bring it up from time to time. Every time they run see... an Errol Flynn or a Fred McMurray retrospective. Yes, and I just forgot the broad's name, and I say broad because that's how she's referred to in the movie. Um, Baxter? Who is it? Phyllis Baxter, maybe. No, Idol Lupino. No, not, no. Not, not Idol Lupino. That's okay. No, Go not I looking. Anyway, it established her as a bombshell from then on. Uh, okay. But long and the short, um, it's filmed in 1940. So you're right at that transition period. Remember 23 April, they start repainting everything light gray? Well, they started filming before 23 April. So you've got scenes of these different aircraft flying along in full pre war colors. You have scenes of airplanes in overall light gray, newly repainted. Um, you have one scene where supposedly Errol Flynn is flying his uh, N3N inverted over um, uh, reef. San Diego. Thank you, over San Diego, over NAS San Diego. And you can see uh, PBYs in the background, several of which have been painted a darker color that looks to be blue-gray. The movement is so fast that you can't really tell, but most of them look to be blue-gray. There was one airplane that when I freeze frame, I could swear that airplane was dark green, but again, that's no way to prove that the airplane was painted that color. But you get there right at that period where everything is changing, and you've got incredible things. You've got uh, after the death of, uh, of a friend who uh, 
uh, went off flying when he was told he shouldn't fly anymore, and uh, he dies. And, and in a somber, reflective mood, because uh, real men don't cry, uh, Fred McMurray wanders off to the flight line where you have a number of uh, PBYs that appear to be painted a very dark uh, aluminum color or perhaps a dark uh, or maybe light gray color. I've not been able to get a, a good handle on what they are painted. They appear to also be painted a special um, undersurface color that was, uh, um, oh Lord, I can't even remember the name of it. It was a, a rarely used color. It was used for less than a year uh, as a sealant to prevent the undersides from leaking uh, after repeated landings in hard water. And uh, I'm guessing that what he's standing in front of for all of that six or seven reflective seconds, he's busy looking into his future as an aviator. I'm busy looking at, what the hell did they paint those airplanes? It's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's just a really great, um, uh, great scene that I, I want to go out and throttle the cameraman for not doing a 360 of Fred McMurray as he walks around the airplanes to get a good idea how they actually were painted. Uh, it's, it's got a typical boneheaded spigweed plot uh, combined with um, incredible photography and some really good music. Dana, Yo. I got a question. Were studies ever done to validate the, the benefit of these things. I mean, it's, it's a little bit like Catch-22 where a guy would schedule parades because that was his authority to schedule parades. Uh, right. you know, it's, they, they had paint, they had a lot of people that they needed to keep busy, so they, these airplanes just kept changing color. Now, the, the question is, from a modeler's perspective, you've covered it, but from an operational perspective, is there any value to all of this? Have, no. Has anybody ever come up and said, yeah, that gray worked, this blue didn't? Uh, the closest is that New Jersey shore test, um, which was really a half-assed. Um, well, I don't mean a, a self-test, because that's like kissing your sister. You right. Know? No, the actual tests that prove what's best don't come until 1942, when Dayton Brown gets put in charge. And one of the things that's interesting, just second, Art, one of the things that's interesting is that you remember Bittinger, was put in charge of, of running all these early tests. Well, when the Navy gets interested in, in starting over in, in 1939 and getting a better idea what to do, Buer says, well, I think it's time we get real scientists involved and, and stop using artists. God, oh, artists! Stop <laughs> using artists to help us design our camouflages. The result being, then instead of the only man who's trained in optical science, uh, Bittinger, at, an MIT trained engineer scientist, they go to Barclay, who's an artist. They go to Dayton Brown, who's an artist, but a really gifted one when it comes to painting airplanes. And, and they abandon any use of scientific notation for the colors they're using. They don't use Monsell ever again from that point. Um, there are a couple of times where Dayton Brown brings it up in reports, but nobody else is using it. And it isn't until they start doing serious tests in 42 and 43 under the guidance of Dayton Brown that they start to realize just how bad some of their schemes are. What'd they find out? They found out that white is better undersides for most altitudes the Navy was flying at. They found that a much darker color called uh, dark blue uh, was better for upper surface and side when you're painting a, an aircraft for hiding against the sea or against the, the ground. As a matter of fact, and, and actually better color for hiding on a, a carrier deck, um, the color dark blue is never mentioned at all in any of the uh, specifications, and yet it was standardized. Um, Fully one third of all the paint, of all the upper surface camouflage paint sent to the South Pacific in 1943 was dark blue. They're loading up the place with all this dark blue paint and never mentioning it. They finally, in, 19, uh, in December 1943, decide to issue a new order. And the order says several things. Number one, 
the upper surface color of all airplanes will be blue gray. The under surface colors of all airplanes will be white and the color blue gray will be matched to dark blue. So instead of actually saying we're using dark blue, they use dark blue, but they call it blue gray. So all of the subsequent reports to tell you blue gray are actually talking about dark blue. Oh. <laughs> Go now ahead, uh, Art, you've, you've had something yeah. for a while. One of, the, one of the peculiarities in the film is it's pretty clear that Warner Brothers got, got, and Technicolor got uh, caught uh, uh, in the midst of paint color change. But I would note the uh, the beautiful spectac and spectacular material of Vindicators, which have been have been partially repainted, so they are carrying the properly left upper, right under surface U.S. roundels or U.S. markings. Yet they're still carrying the chrome yellow and uh, and silver schemes. Indeed. The other, I'm actually, the other I'm important, based on that. The other important thing you'll see on the Vindicators is that part of the plot has to do with three buddies who are all great naval aviators, uh, and they have one common enemy, which is Errol Flynn. But they all, <laughs> they all, well, he gets all the girls, and he starts off from money. But anyway, um, the three heroes um, all are member of the Top Hat Squadron, okay? So they've all got cigarette lighters with top hats on them. However, by the time they're filming the movie, the top hats have been transferred to uh, the Atlantic. And so they're stuck with the Panther Squadron in the Vindicators. The only dive bombers they have are the Panther Squadron. So if you look really closely at the uh, close-ups when they're showing these SB2Us, you can see where they've painted over the, the Panther with aluminum paint and put a top hat on the side of the airplane. <laughs> several months later, both squadrons get transferred over to the Atlantic and they actually do exchange the, uh, the unit insignia for the two units. Uh, VB4 becomes VB3 and vice versa. And they actually do exchange the, the insignia that are there, the top hats become the Panthers, the Panthers become the top hats and everything. So yeah, great movie. Um, uh, gangs of fun to just sit there and um, make sure you don't drool over your remote or you will uh, short it all out and there's no telling <laughs> what will happen. Yep. Uh, Dana, real quick, you just mentioned about the white undersides and the darker yep. up, upper sides. Does that sort of lead to the fact that the Atlantic scheme was actually probably closer to what should have been used, except it was a gray versus a blue. Well, um, yeah, you'll know, one of the things that comes up from the reports, I had to make this fairly short when I did the presentation, is they're painting all these different versions of purple blue, very pale purple blue underneath, very pale uh, light gray underneath. And every time they get sighted by a different ship, the same report comes back it doesn't help. It doesn't make any difference. Nothing. The only reason we could tell this airplane was uh, supposed to be camouflaged was we could see it didn't have a red tail. Um, so all the undersurface colors fail miserably. And when they do the final report from Buair and, and Naval Research Lab, uh, the report says uh, light gray or light purple blue is the best camouflage for undersurface colors. Despite all the evidence to the contrary, they've gone with this, this color scheme. The, um, uh, the one person that knew better uh, was Dayton Brown, and he of course uses it in his uh, seagull scheme. Um, but even there, you have to realize, mo for most of us, the, what, what we call the Atlantic scheme was not the Atlantic scheme, okay? It was the anti-sub camouflage. It's just that nearly all the anti-submarine airplanes were in the Atlantic. The first Navy anti-submarine camouflage scheme was actually, and this is Navy camouflage as opposed to borrowing somebody else's, is developed at um, uh, uh, North Island. And it is um, dark blue on top, uh, light gray on the sides, 
and white on the bottom. And this was developed in, in mid-1942. It sees very little use, but it is the standard. So when we run into these really odd painted uh, PB4Ys in uh, 1942 and 1943, it's a good guess that's what they're painted. It's just we don't have proof. And again, just as they're getting ready to, to put all of this into SR2 and SR15, the Navy regulations, that's when the anti-submarine scheme one and anti-submarine scheme two are developed. And, uh, and there is evidence that some of those anti-submarine aircraft were actually painted that way in Hawaii and on the, um, uh, and on the Pacific uh, West Coast. So uh, I'd love to have a walk around of one of those airplanes to prove that's what we're looking at. Uh, the first chapter I decided to write for this book, I wanted to start off easy just to get back to writing. And so I chose to write the anti-submarine warfare chapter. That was a mistake. Um, <laughs> it took me four months to get through just what they were thinking with all the weird arguments and people saying this is best and that's best and here's what we want until they finally came up with a, a, a final scheme, which was the uh, the dark gold gray, light gold gray, white variations. So, um, but again, cool stuff. Who when else has a question? Copies? Say what, Art? When do you expect to be able to publish? I expect to be able to publish six months ago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> have I mentioned writer's block is set in? I'm... I am having a lot of trouble writing right now. Uh, I stopped going to the archives in late January, early February, with a plan to spend two or three months in the basement here, welcome to my basement, uh, doing nothing but writing, then go back to the archives to find some of the missing stuff that I uh, knew was waiting for me and continue writing. Well, instead I've been stuck here in the basement uh, you never know you get cabin fever until you can't go out. And uh, I've got some real cabin fever. The other problem is trying to just make sense of all the documents I've got. Um, I, what I showed you tonight is the reduced version of what happened. What you're not seeing much of, at least, is all the different people going their own direction at the same time, issuing different orders of what is supposed to be the standard. Um, and finally coming together for a standard that shows up in the regulations. Um, that I have to do in a book, you have to put that in. Um, in a talk, you kind of gloss it over. I'm good. Anyone else? You want to hear the Moss story? Sure. Yes. <laughs> I wish Jim was here. Art, pass it on, or I'll pass it on. We'll get Jim involved somehow. At a NorisCon several years ago in the, uh, I think it was 1978 or maybe 79. Yeah, uh, several, Jim would, several Moss, would he, cover that. He who loves the Brewster Buffalo above all else, except his wife, decided <laughs> to give an award at a NorisCon for the best Brewster Buffalo model. Well, right at this occasion, uh, Bob Cressman showed me the first pictures to come out of the Barclay camouflage Brewster Buffalo. And I knew I had to enter the contest. So I spent four months building a Brewster Buffalo, Tama, Tamiya Brewster Buffalo, with the best I understood the colors to be. Um, I'll be right there. Trust me, it was memorable then, it will be memorable now. <laughs> I believed it looked a lot like this. Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah. So yeah. More yeah. yeah. okay, yeah. so I put the whole thing together, painted up in the scheme, and drove up to, I believe, Syracuse. It might have been Binghamton, but somewhere in, in New York, in the free state of New York, <laughs> and uh, waited until Moss left the contest room and <laughs> put the buffalo down in the category for best Brewster buffalo. And of course, I knew that if I put my name on the um, on the uh, on the form, he'd come and pester me to know all about it. Well, that's no fun. So I wrote my name down as D. Moore McMillan, D for my first 
<laughs> first name Dana, Moore my middle name, and um, McMillan being the Bell family clan. Um, <laughs> and left it there. Well, a little while later, Jim comes into the room and he looks across and he sees there's another Bruce from Buffalo. <laughs> and from across the room, he says, nah, uh-uh, no, no. Then he goes walking across the room and he gets closer and he starts seeing this ugly piece of crap. And he gets closer and closer and closer. And finally, no, uh, uh, mm, no, no, no. And he pulls up the scene, the, the sheet, and he, he yells as loud as he can, is there a D. Moore McMillan in the room? <laughs> well, on top of everything else, I was living down here, D.C. chapter at the time. Um, so I couldn't put D.C. chapter. We put down Brooklyn chapter. And we got uh, Joe... Yep. Joe Turner. Turner. Joe Turner. Joe Turner. God, rest his soul. God bless him. God we bless got him. Joe Turner involved and said, uh, Joe, we need to use a chapter. And, and so Jim, Jim races off to find Joe Turner. Well, Joe had made a couple of changes to who D. Moore McMillan was. Number one, he was just over six foot tall, <laughs> and, and he, he was an African American. You can't miss him. <laughs> All right? So... So Moss is out of the room, and I take the three pictures of the actual Brewster Buffalo. As soon as Moss has left the contest room, I go over and I put them. Now, you have to realize, on a joke like this, you only do it to a friend who appreciates a good joke. And Moss, God bless him, doesn't mind being the victim of a good joke. So I put the three pictures down next to it, and Moss comes back in. Now, for the rest, this is Friday night, until sometime Sunday morning, Every time Jim Moss sat down to get a bite to eat or sat down for, for whatever or was off having a conversation, um, somebody would come and say, hey, Jim, over in the <laughs> contest room, there's some big black guy named McMillan looking for you. He wants to talk to you about this scheme. I don't think Jim managed to finish a meal. I think people would wait until the, the waitress would put a plate in front of him to come by and say, hey, Moss. Have you seen this guy McMillan? He's over in the in the uh, in the vendor room. He's got some stuff for you on the Brewster Buffalo. And so to this day, when when Jim Jim was told obviously just before the uh, awards were given out who D. Moore McMillan really was, but uh, to this day he has to mention D. Moore McMillan anytime we're talking or or emailing each other. And uh, that is the story of Jim Moss and the Barkley camouflage scheme. <laughs> kind of like the Captain Tuttle episode from MASH. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Anyway, that, that's the end of that story. Uh, I see that we are past 9 o'clock, and all good children need to be in bed at this moment. <laughs>